Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored today to welcome to the show from the County of Brant, Ontario, Councillor Lucas Oakley. Councillor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. So, Lucas, let's get the big question out of the way. And I start all my interviews off with the exact same question. So you're no exception to the first question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? So it's it's kind of a, a complicated one. Um, I would say so during the pandemic, you know, there are lots of uh, global change. And um, I was sitting in my house kind of... Um, during the pandemic, I was very lucky to be able to afford to buy a house. And I was looking just, you know, through the market as everything was skyrocketing through 2020 and 2021. And I'm just going there and, and shaking my head. And I'm talking to a realtor I know about what my house would be worth now and, and comparing it to um, just before the pandemic. I, had the op- I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel into Europe and looking there and, and comparing the house pricing and and talking to my peers, you know, none of my peers are able to afford afford housing, um, uh, even though, you know, we, we had done everything correct, right? You know, I, we'd gone to school, as everyone had told them to, uh, got university degrees, uh, come out, and it's a dime a dozen, so you're working barely above minimum wage. You know, if you get lucky, you get up to $20, $25 an hour, but still you're decades away from being able to actually save to afford a house unless you um, get lucky in some fashion. And comparing that to, yeah, looking in Europe and it's like, well, for the same price as my house here, I could go and overlook the Mediterranean, have a vineyard and all these, all these things. And I decided to myself, I either, I either needed to just give up and go and, and, and move somewhere that sort of fit my vision of, of what things should be, or I need to get involved and start getting involved. So I got involved throughout the 2022 uh, provincial election and, and some of the, the tail end of the 2021 federal and I ended up meeting my predecessor on council, Mark Laferriere, speaking to him and talking about um, what kind of impact you can have on the local level. You know, um, it, being a politician is never something I imagined, never something I really uh, thought I'd be interested in doing. But in talking to him and and uh, sort of the impact you can have as a local politician, um, that's where sort of my interest came in. And, and you know, um, you know, at the local level, we have at least some degree of control over over housing and the types of housing, um, pushing back against NIMBYism, um, looking at new and creative solutions for um, both people my age, seniors, things like that. So that's sort of where I ended up going, you know, what? this is something that um, 
I think I might be interested in and I think I should pursue. And then I get the rest is history. I knocked on lots of doors and and here I am. It's a good story and I'm going to dissect it a lot with you here in a few, for, for sure. over the next few minutes. So I want to start by asking this question because I find it fascinating when I, I, I ask this question, I get the answers that range from yes to no's to sometimes yes, sometimes no. But growing up, was politics discussed at the dinner table? And if so, was it federal, provincial, and even municipal? Or as some of my guests who have come on the show, municipal wasn't talked about because it wasn't the quote unquote sexy politics that people have come <laughs> to love on Twitter and social media via provincial and federal politics. So, yeah, municipal wasn't discussed at all. Uh, occasionally, provincial and federal politics would be discussed, but only sparingly, both um, growing up, um, first my my mom and my dad, and then my mom and my stepdad. Um, and my mom was always the type of person of like, eh, politicians are all mostly the same. It doesn't really matter. Um, both of my uh, father figures, you know, were, were um, uh, big on, on, on conservatism and stuff like that. So it wasn't really overly dis discussed, you know, the whole you don't discuss religion, politics at the table type of thing. Uh, so it wasn't overly discussed uh, much at all uh, growing up. So when did the municipal bug hit? Was it just after that provincial election in 2022 where you were able to chat with your predecessor? Or had you had some uh, interest in uh, municipal governance prior to the 2022 provincial election where you finally were able to sit down with your predecessor and say, well, how can I make a difference? It was it was 100 percent during the provincial election. I uh, I had the opportunity to go out and canvas with my predecessor, with one of the candidates, uh, going around door knocking and sort of chatting with with him about that. And, and uh, you know, the that, you know, us as the county compared to the city of Brantford, our police budget is like five percent of the budget where there's just 30. And and that allows us more flexibility because we have the OPP. But then there's the trade off with, you know, um, for example, you know, in, in Paris, we have two dedicated OPP officers to do patrol, but that means we don't have as many officers doing speed control and the trade-offs with that. So that whole aspect of where you can um, use your resources to to optimize for different attributes. I, I I love spreadsheets. I love optimization. So so that sort of whole aspect of it really interests and piqued my interest from there, especially, um, you know, the, the whole idea of provincial and federal politics. There's there's the party politics, right? And and uh, as an independent politician from the municipal side, um, because Mark LaFerriere previously ran as a federal NDP candidate for both 2011, 2015. I, I thought um, the name sounded very familiar. I was like, yes, I, I, I know yes, the he, name. He ran, I... um, <laughs> yeah, he ran uh, twice there and then ran in 2018 for the uh, Brant County uh, Councilor position and was successful there. And sort of talk, go, talking over the aspects of, you know, uh, it's all well and good to have party politics you know it makes it really easy for the the layman to be able to come in and understand you know you don't have to know a ton about the candidate you can just kind of understand the party lines but the the flexibility it allows you and sort of um and just just as a point of comparison so when i was going around door knocking uh for the provincial campaign you know you open the door you got your uh red blue orange whatever shirt and people have very predetermined opinion they open up the door and they either say what you they want to hear or they ask you, you know, they're not really listening too much on what you have to say because lots of people already have a preconceived notion. Um, and then I went around sort of door knocking as a municipal, as a municipal um, candidate a couple months later, and I found the conversations were a lot more in depth. People were willing to have the conversation and listen, even though, you know, I'm still a progressive, progressive politician. I'm still more or less talking about the same thing, just on a smaller scale. Now that message was hitting a lot better because people are, are, um, more engaged with it. Um, there's not this specter of, you know, past party politicians. So uh, that sort of thing. So that sort of aspect really started to interest me where, um, yeah, with the provincial and federal, right? You, I mean, your your goose might be cooked, whether from, from the get-go, no matter how good of a candidate are, you are, because that's just how the polls are going these days. So that sort of aspect really interests me when I started talking to them about that. I, I want to get to the 2022 municipal campaign that you finally yes, decide yeah. that you're going to put your name forward. 
I'm assuming this is not just a light switch moment in a day that you say, wake up on a Tuesday and say, hey, let's do it. Let's put my name finally on the <laughs> ballot. I'm assuming it took some time and some consideration because there's a lot to consider when putting your name yep. forward. Do you have the team? Do you have the uh, potential backing of people who are willing to put a financial contributions into your campaign? What was that moment for you when you said, okay, now it's Lucas's time. Now it's time for yep. Lucas to finally be on the council. And I believe my vision and my sort of perspective would be beneficial to the county if elected in October. Yeah. So um, I, I had spent the time after that sort of thinking for, for a couple months there. And um, you, you mean know, the I, provincial I, election, I, right? Yeah. After yeah, the yeah. Provin so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it was during and because and, I, I registered uh, to run July or sorry, not July, June 10th, about eight days after the, the provincial election. So I was thinking uh, during the course of, of help of campaigning for that. And um, I was sitting on, on my porch with, with a friend of mine sort of going over, you know, sort of some ideas I had in regards to transit, in regards to housing. You know, is this a, a message we think would make sense, you know, um, just trying to consider, you know, is is my own bias as, as a younger person impacting, um, you, you know, do I have a, one of the things that really was preventing me from running initially was, um, you know, does politics really need another straight, white, cis, male, you know, that kind of thing, right? But then, I, you know, I'm sort of going through and and um, at that point, a couple of candidates had already regist registered and I'm like, you know, I, I think I still have something unique to bring to the table, unique perspective, even if I, I can't contribute on sort of that diversity angle. Um, I'm still a lot younger than than most candidates um, in, in municipal politics. You know, most you people might be asking age, how old you are. 27. I turned 27 just last week, actually. Oh, well, happy um, belated birthday. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, um, part of the problem that we have in municipal politics is, is, you know, there's a lot of nimbyism and it comes from, um, you know, the people who are involved typically are due to the work schedule are retired or, um, late career, um, <laughs> self-employed, things like this. Not many people are in my type of position or, um, single parents or parents at all. Um, which I was very fortunate when I got elected to come on with, uh, with two other counselors, counselors, Kyle and Garneau, who both also are um, uh, parents, which they're taking that that role on and, and sort of a unique viewpoint there. So um, I, I was like, you know, I think I have enough of a unique viewpoint that my position on council is is, is worth pursuing. So that's where I, I kind of went from there. Um, you you decide you're going to put your name forward, and I you had just ran a provincial campaign. Well, you had helped out on a provincial campaign. Yes. The federal campaign had happened, and then you in your statement earlier on, you talked about how when you went to the doors in your own municipal campaign, people were more willing mm -hmm. to chat with you, and yep. I. I, I I, I am a big believer that people are apathetic when it comes to municipal governance. They understand yep. that there's three levels of governments, but they I don't I don't fully believe that people know what the jurisdictions are. When yep. you were at the door talking to people, and I'm not trying to paint a broad stroke here, but yeah. were people talking to you about more municipal issues or were they talking about provincial and federal issues? And as a municipal candidate at the time, how did you address those individual needs? Because you never know what you're going to hear at the door when you knock on that door and someone comes to it and oh, absolutely. <laughs> talks about their issue. So uh, I, I found, so right now the County of Branth is going through a period of, of explosive growth. So the County as a whole has grown 10% over the past, uh, between the 2016 and 2021 census. Paris though, which is the Paris, the area I represent has grown 25%. And we're projected within the next 10, 15 years to go from, uh, we're at 15,000 people. Now we're going to wind up in and around uh, 21,000, 20,000, 21,000 people. So explosive growth right now. So there was a lot of, though the, the turnout was predictable for municipal elections, still only in the, you know, uh, high 20s. <laughs> I was going to say, um, wasn't it like the 20s? <laughs> like this, it, yeah, it, I, the I like how that's a typical good, but, turnout for Ontario yeah. a municipal but elections. the people who actually came to the door and wanted to chat were very passionate about it because their community is drastically changing. Um, and part of the, you know, 
what I thought what was kind of my unique perspective to bring on is, is yes, the way that we're growing right now, I don't think is productive, but we still do need to grow and we need to be building the right types of housing. So most, most of the time I would knock on the door and they're like, you know, this growth is unacceptable. You should just say no to all development. We don't want to see any of it. But after you have the conversation of like, well, you know, so I myself was only able to afford a house because um, I got lucky in the market and then I bought, you know, 800 square foot house. Well, none of these houses that are being built are in that profile. None, none of them are, um, my, my colleague, uh, Councillor Howes often use the terms modest housing. None of these are modest houses. You know, back in the 40s and 50s and things, we built modest houses, not with, you know, the luxury tag to it, all this type of stuff. So I'm like, you know, I, I agree with you. You know, do we need to be building sprawling fields of multi-million dollar townhomes? No, but we still do need to grow. You know, we, we have our urban boundaries and we need to be building stuff that people within the community can afford. And there was also a lot of, um, like, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of new people to Paris. We don't want to necessarily see new people in Paris. I'm like, well, there's lots of benefits to having new people come in. Um, and it's, it's, it's hardly the fault of the people who are finding a home to buy. It happens to be in Paris or they, they want to move to Paris. It's hardly their fault, the types of housing that developers are building. That's entirely to do with how the, uh, the relationship between the developer, the municipality and the province are handling these things. So that's, that, that was my perspective going door to door to door and, and, and people evidently, you know, um, fed into that message and, 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 and appreciated that message. Um, but yeah, people were very, um, the people who wanted to chat were very passionate about it because they're experiencing a lot of change and that change hasn't always been strictly productive for, uh, the town of Paris. Um, we're way behind on infrastructure, things like this. So, yeah. So we're going to talk about the community and the county as a whole in a few minutes, but I want to talk yeah. now about the role of a councillor. Now mm -hmm. you get elected in October of 2022 and you're relatively within your still your first year of being an yeah. uh, elected official. I can imagine someone like yourself who seems passionate about their community, who seems to want the best for their community. You dig into that package, the agenda package every time you get it, and you make sure you know what you are going to be voting on. And yep. you need to go out and talk to people and get their ideas of what they believe is the best for their community as well. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to be informed on the decisions you're about to make, but not be ingrained in the the final vote until you have to make it because you may hear something from a fellow counselor that may sway you into their opinion or sway you against the way you were thinking. How important is it for you to be informed, engaged, but also fluid when it comes to making decisions around that council table? Oh, it's, it's very important. Uh, you know, I have a strong philosophy of, of, you know, um, keeping open, open mind and never shutting a door that could be, kept open so when, when i when i go through I, I read my notes i i i always do a minimum of, of two passes through an agenda um and and then i i, I confer with uh, my fellow counselors and, and and residents and and uh and things like that and and a couple of friends i know who are more um like as i mentioned i never intended to be a politician so you know i never took political science i was uh you know i did chemistry and stuff like that so just sort of I pass my ideas through, I'm going to say like a dozen people before I get to council. Um, and yeah, I, I, I always try to go in with, with an open mind, um, open to hearing uh, the other counselors perspectives. Like, uh, you know, I, I am in a semi urban rural municipality. I know plenty about living in Paris. I don't necessarily know much about farming or, and, and how the impacts of that. So I might read through something in regards to a severance and I'm like this does or doesn't make sense but you know I'm open to hear uh, my colleagues opinions when, when they come through and, and and lend their opinion you know um, there's uh, sort of some of the conversation we've had lately in regards to development and what's you know what's good farmland when we just went through our official plan so we're talking about official plan or you know settlement boundary expansions um, there's lots of people who would be just like want to be cold cut and dry any farmland can't be converted and then there's other people like, well, it's not good farmland. We should convert it. And the sort of whole relationship between 
farmers are business people. They're not altruistic, right? Ultimately, you got to do what put, what puts food on on the table for your family. So, sort of that whole interaction between, of course, we'd love to keep all farm and never never touch any of it. But the reality is, we we do have to grow. Uh, we have to choose where to grow, and having that whole conversation between the the various stakeholders. Now, you've mentioned the acronym NIMBYism twice already in this interview, <laughs> yes. and I'm assuming it's a key word that you uh, hear a lot or you're dealing with a lot. How do you as counselor balance the needs of your community against the people who don't want to see it change drastically, who move to their community in the hopes for a, t- a different type of uh, life? You're not the only counselor or elected official who has talked about NIMBYism in their community, and it's running mm-hmm. rampant across this country. How do you see your role in not battling against the NIMBYism, but understanding where they're coming from, but also understanding that you have to look at the county as a whole and move it forward? Mm-hmm. Well, I think you know having that conversation, uh, like I mentioned at the doors with, um, you know, let's look realistically at what, you know, what, what, what is the market? What can people afford? And it's like, um, you know, people would love to have nothing change, but you know, is, is that the, is that the stance you're willing to take? If that means your kids and grandkids are going to live in your house forever, forever. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Multi-generational is an, is an, is an option. Um, it's something actually, you know, my, my mother's been bugging for us to do and just big, buy this big giant house and we'll all live in it forever. Um, not on board with with that personally but you know if it works for people it works for people but when you bring that up people kind of go well yeah that makes sense and i'm like you know you you, these days you can't just build a single family home because the next question is well let's just build small single family homes well because of investors provincial policy things like this those those homes are just going to get snapped up by by investors and things like that. It's still not going to end up in in the hands of your kids or grandkids. So so what kind of compromises are people willing to make for that? So that that's sort of I try to have the conversation in regards to that with people. Are people willing um, to have the conversation though? Quite quite often, and more so than than I think people initially think they would, and how most people project as with you know staunch NIMBYs not wanting to have the conversation. Lots of times when you actually speak to people person to person, they're a lot more willing to have the conversation. And it might not be, I mean, you're not going to give them all the way from, you know, we don't want anything but a state lots being built to we're going to put up a 22 story building, but for where we are as a municipality anyways, that's not appropriate anyhow. And that's where I think you get into the conversation of um, even from myself wanting to, you know, not take a, a, let's call a YIMBY stance. Um, you know, there's still a big difference on what is appropriate for 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 the community feel. That's often uh, quoted as as like a NIMBY phrase. You know, it doesn't fit the community feel. But there is a big difference between saying, "Well, we only have single family homes, so let's add multiplexes, probably be appropriate," versus "We only have single family homes, let's do the 22 story skyscraper." Are we eventually going to get to that skyscraper? Who could say? In a hundred years, I don't. You know, I'm not going to be around to make those decisions. But right now, no, not appropriate. So um, trying to find that balance and and having that conversation, I think it has been productive. Is it challenging to find a balance? Because I can imagine you as the counselor for your ward, because the the county of Brant is broken up into a ward system. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the people who've elected you, but you also as a counselor, and you know this better than most people, you have to look at the county as a whole. You can't pick one ward over the other you have to look at it as a whole how do you balance that aspect of the job because you want the best for your community the people who've elected you but you mm-hmm. know sometimes when budget comes around or when you just did your uh, first budget sometimes ward your ward won't get everything that they want or needs and yep. sometimes it has to be pushed off how do you balance that so for the most part, the, the way I try to balance it is when I'm going through a decision, I think to myself, am I doing this to get reelected? If if the answer is yes, then I need to reconsider the, the answer because, you know, electoral You're the very first counselor to say that on this show. You are the very oh. first counselor to say this on the show. And I have a follow up to that. So continue on okay. because I want to follow yeah. up with that. 
because electoral politics is great. It, I mean, it's a, the fundamental aspect of a democracy, and it's the the best system there is. But you fall into this this uh, risk of having your decisions motivated by arbitrarily appeasing the the population of people who are most likely to vote, and and that's not and and historically we can see you know with you know within it, indigenous people with young people with um you know various equity seeking groups um they're not always the largest voter base but it doesn't mean that they they can or should be ignored you have to acknowledge the, those aspects so in regards to the budget for example you know we're, we're talking about things about um uh or, or some of our strategic plan about um uh specifically we have like some quizzes uh, you know we put out a quiz with responses and it's like you know uh do you feel the county of brant um is equitable or inclusive and the answer was 87 percent of people said yes that seems like a good number until you consider the fact that our diverse population is about 10 percent. so it looks the, the the numbers then would probably you believe that most of our diverse people are not feeling included so or when it comes to bike lanes most people say that they don't want bike lanes but there's 40% of people who are saying they do. And that's probably the 40% of the population um, that we need to find um, or that need the assistance. You know, this is the, the whole conversation between equity and uh, equality, right? It, we can make everything equal. That doesn't mean it's equitable. Um, so that's kind of where I'll, when I hear from people, um, I guess, yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to say in regards to like, um, in making those decisions, you can't always just the squeakiest wheel gets the grease type of thing. And you can't always think of it of, um, yeah, how, is this going to get me reelected? Because that's not, you know, if if that was, I don't feel like this, I would be wanting to be involved in that role if that was just my concern. Like I said, I never had any desire to be a politician. So for me, I what I want to do is make transformative change and make a difference for people. One one of the, my past guests, counsel, uh, sorry, not counselor, but warden Marcus Ryan from Oxford County, from yeah, from Oxford yes. County, he's he came on the show and he talked about how he's able to put his head down at night. At the end of the day, the decisions you make around the council table, you have to stand beside, and you sometimes you might get it wrong, sometimes you might get it right, but at the end of the day, he has to be able to put his his head down on his pillow and go to sleep and feel like he's yep. done his best job. When you talk about the fact that you can't make a decision based on being reelected, is it hard to make the tough decisions in a in a community that, or a local community? Because you're not in Ottawa, you're not in Toronto making this, this these decisions. The decisions you make around those council tables affects the people the day after. So, mm-hmm. is it hard to make the tough decisions and be able to put your head at, down at night and say? I did my best. I, I hope I did the right thing for the, the betterment of our community. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, I tend to overanalyze everything I do. So even after this is made, I go back home and I'm like, should I have said this or said that? And most, most of the times I feel comfortable in how I voted. I, you know, I've, I've gone through the pro- my process, uh, made the decision as well as I can based on the data that I have. Um, but it does, con- yeah. It it does. Con- it's it's my community uh, that that we're impacting, and um, it, it to to go back and, and reference the official plan amendments and and the urban boundary expansions. You know, something that I was very passionate about, am very passionate about, and campaigned on a lot is is pr- protecting our environment. How does it, the, but the, there's ultimately come down to the prag- pragmatic and practical decisions of of what needs to happen and, and where you need to. To give on these things so so that type of stuff um i wouldn't say keep like keeps me up at night but i but it, it's constantly on my mind when i'm make, making these decisions of um you know what is going to be long-term impact of these things i'm impacting my community and um you know have i made the right decision ultimately i have made the decision based on the information i have and, and to the best of my ability but could we have deferred this could we have had more good discussion so <laughs> you you've been in the position for almost like i said almost a year now coming by the time this records have over half a year in the position 
have you found the work-life balance uh, manageable? Because you are now officially part of a organization that when you go out to the grocery store, you're still a counselor. When you go to yep. an event, you're still a counselor. When you go to a restaurant, you're still a counselor. And I'm assuming, because every other uh, municipal counselor I talked to have said the same thing, that you get stopped and you will help get people asking you questions potentially about mm -hmm. the decisions you've made or their concerns of what's going on in the community. Have you found to be have you found a balance of being able to be a counselor, but from time to time just being Lucas? Yeah, so I've been very fortunate in that um, the county of Brent has a ward a ward mate system. So we have two counselors per ward, and um, my um, colleague, Councillor House, um, if you look at the electoral results, uh, blew the rest of us out of the water. Quite frankly, like amazing turnout he is very good at what he does very very popular and it's actually it's it's been fantastic it's given me a lot of yeah i had the first six months where people would still just prefer to talk to steve which was it gave me a lot of opportunity to really learn the role get into the role and sort of insulate myself in that regards now more people are contacting me stopping me in the streets things like that um, but it, it was very beneficial having such a an excellent partner in this um, to sort of help me learn the ropes. And then same with my predecessor, Mark LaFerriere. He he also still, I call him once a month and we, and we go over things. And uh, so I've had a lot of great mentors to help me with that. And the work-life balance has, has been, it's been challenging, uh, especially because we've had official plans, strategic plan, um, all the training sessions that we go through. Uh, which I wasn't aware. Uh, actually, we do significantly more training than most munis mis most municipalities, um, which has been challenging in, in some regards, um, just from a scheduling standpoint. But it's been great in that I've learned lots, and and it's prov provided me with the tools to properly make these decisions. So, uh, the work life balance has been challenging to manage, but uh, I feel at at you know at this point eight months and I've hit a good stride with it. I want to talk about the county as a whole now. Before I ask this yeah. question, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. We kind of always get emails about this question. I don't know why. But here we go. Councillor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the county of Brant today as of recording? Or what are the big issues facing the county as of recording? So for us, it's it's the rapid growth. Um, as much as we do need the housing, it is we've we've had uh, from I think about 2010, we were about 8,000 people in Paris. Couldn't tell you the county number specifically then. Um, to we're at 15,000 people now. We've doubled in size in that in that span of time in in 13 years. So we have rapid rapid growth, and infrastructure is not built quickly. It is not built overnight. Um, so it's one of our biggest issues right now is just keeping up with the growth. There's a there's a lot of other, you know, growing pains with that. Um, as I've mentioned from the diversity, equity, inclusion side of things, I think we, we have a lot to do in regards to um, combating any xenophobia and in, in integrating new people. Um, but as a, as an organization, one of our largest issues is just keeping up with the, the infrastructure required um, back in the. Uh, the 70s, there was an opportunity to build this bridge. Council at the time decided against it. And now uh, we have to fit all of our traffic that in this population is doubled in size through two lanes through downtown. And uh, if we wanted to widen the road, we'd have to, um, you know, move each of the buildings back 12 feet. And that would end up with the buildings on one side and a river. So that doesn't really work too well. Um so we have lots of those concerns and, and especially with that, with all of our growth being very concentrated in one area, um, Paris for now, St. George is, is lined up to be next. Um, just the, the conversation between how we making sure that all the resources, as much as I represent Paris, uh, or North end of Paris specifically, making sure all our resources don't purely get poured into our urban areas because our rural rural areas also need support as well and making sure that their voice isn't lost in this 
Um, you, you talk about growth. You talk about infrastructure. It is a dire need for a lot of municipalities across this country. How do you see your role as counselor in helping address this issue? Because growth is good. I, I don't mm-hmm. care who you are. Growth is good. Like when people are coming Absolutely. to your community, I'm happy because I understand that if people come to our community, they live in our community, they pay taxes, means that my taxes are potentially going to go down a little bit or stay the same over a few years as growth continues. How do you see your role as a, a counselor in helping address some of these issues at a county level, but also advocating at a provincial and federal level? So I think some of the conversation or some some of our role is going to be having those. Con- I think there are going to be some tough conversations coming soon in regards to do we want to be a high service municipality like we currently were for a, a municipality of our geographic size and shape. We're a weird donut around Brantford. Um, we offer a lot of services. We have a transit service. Um, we have uh, a lot of staff. Um we provide a lot of services. Um, our tax rate also is one of the lowest um, of our competitors in Ontario. We're 30% under Brantford. We're 25% under uh, Haldimand or no- Norfolk or Kitchener, Waterloo. Um, our closest competitors are City of Toronto, City of Brampton, and City of Ottawa, which have, you know, very, you know, density comes with cost savings and scale of economy. So I think we're going to have to have some conversations in regard to our is our is our goal to have a very low tax rate, which we could do. We're going to have to remove some services. Infrastructure is going to take longer to build, and and we're going to struggle in, in that time. Or do we want to maintain higher higher services? And our, we have some of the best staff. I, I would say some of the best staff of any municipality in Ontario right now. We have fantastic staff. So, um. Are we wanting to continue to empower them and and make sure that we're 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 paying them well and and, and investing in these services? That's going to have to come with a bit of a a tax hit, um, especially with you know stuff like Bill Twenty Three, Bill One Hundred Nine. The province is also downloading a lot of these costs. Um, we advocate it's, constantly. Hey, it ain't so. The province downloads things onto municipalities. What? Hey, hey, you know, <laughs> okay, you know, occasionally these things might happen. Um, so you. Know, you know, we, we have conversations with with the province and in regards to building interchanges, building bridges, and most of the conversation we get back is figure it out. So, uh, you know, at a certain point, we're, we're going to have to decide, are we going to keep asking the province and waiting on the province to come and give us money, or are we going to have to bite the bullet and find a way to fund it ourselves? Um, I would lean towards the latter because, we, you know, we're going to just fall further behind if we don't find a way to fund it ourselves. I want to talk now about the my my favorite subject because I yeah. realize we're at the half hour mark and I'm like, oh God, we've been talking for a half hour. I can't believe it's been more than a half hour, but here we are. I yeah. like talking about tourism. As someone who is going to be going across Canada, visiting every single community that has come on this show. Uh, so Paris and Brant County, the County of Brant is on the list now. What should tourists do in your county if they come and visit you? So we have um, we have a lot of agritourism. We have a lot of fantastic agricultural uh, communities. Um, we have a variety of breweries and cideries and 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 things like that. It's all we we do great tours with that. Um, Paris itself is nestled between the Nith and the Grand River, so we have a lot of um, outdoor activities and and uh, uh, you know kayaking, canoeing, and rafting down or uh, but yeah, like rafting down the river and tubing down the river. I think that's where it was like, for, like the tubing and stuff. We we have lots of great water activities where we're really looking to expand our arts and culture. Um, we now have three art galleries downtown Paris. Um, we're bringing in lots more restaurants and, and unique foods. Uh, one of my favorite places that just opened up recently, it's called Arepa Love. Uh, I had no idea what an Arepa is, but it's a... Um, south american sandwich made out of like a corn bread cornmeal type thing that's stuffed with all sorts of ingredients that so sounds delicious. that place is fantastic <laughs> uh we have uh, a a building in downtown paris called the wincy mills um historically I, I believe it was a mill uh used to be a canadian tire and now it's sort of um 
a little community market and a lot of businesses are using it as like a pilot, a launch place. So this Arepa Love place came from within there. We now have this taco stall that just opened up in there too. Um, so we're doing lots to pr promote our local artists and local um, people to, to start businesses. And um, so there's, there's lots in that, in that regard. I'm on the, about, the BIA board and the tourism board myself, actually. So what about yourself? You you talk about the, I apologize if I pronounce it wrong here, the rep of love, uh, but yeah. where do you go to decompress after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work? Where do you go in the community to just let it all go and just get back to center? So that way, you know, the next day you're going to be able to do it all over again. We have a lot of nature trails. So I, I take me and my dog out to um, Barker's Bush or out to Apps Mill or Pinehurst and um, just walk through, you know, we have a lot of pristine Carolinian, Carolinian, Carolinian forest. Carolinian, yeah. So, um, uh, so I, I do a lot of reading. So I read these things and I have no idea how they're pronounced. Carolinian, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I do lots of nature walks and that's sort of really what, um, drew me to stay in the County when, you know, for my career and stuff like that, everything pushes me. Most of my peers have all left the County. They've all left for their field for Toronto or Kitchener Waterloo. Um, that's where it would make sense for me to go, but I'm stubborn and I refuse to leave uh, my nice trails. So <laughs> I love it. So I want to end on the million dollar question, Lucas, and this is the most important one through this entire interview. In your opinion, what makes the County of Brant such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think we have a bit of everything for everyone across the county. We're, a, you know, again, as I said, a, a big donut. So we have, you know, if you want a nice, rural, quiet rural area, we have lots of nice, quiet rural areas. We have the agritourism. We have downtown Paris and downtown St. George, which are both small growing but quaint um small towns both with two different fields um so for me uh, that and the and the nature trails and and uh, our rivers is really what draws me to stay in the county lucas i want to thank you so much uh it's greatly appreciated when counselors take time out of their busy schedule to sit down and talk about themselves but also talk about their community and i say this with sincerity your community is better served with you at the council table. I, I think municipal governance and municipal leaders do not get the credit that they deserve. So I'm going to try and start doing that. Thank you for stepping up and serving your community in the uh, County of Brant. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. <laughs> so with that, I want to remind everyone to go put down your phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody, even if it's just for five minutes. So with that, this means the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. Till tomorrow, just keep talking.